Dave, what's going on? You guys doing good? Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us tonight. You can take your seat, but as you do, look at your neighbor. Give him a hug, a high five, a handshake. Give him a random compliment. I don't know. I'm feeling good. I, I don't know if it's because I had a salad today, if I, I'm feeling a little more spry. Look at your other neighbor, the one you rejected for whatever reason. I guess awkwardly compliment them now, too. It feels a little forced, but that's okay. Hey, I know Zach asked this earlier, but uh, anybody first time here hanging out with us tonight? Anybody first time? I'm not going to throw anything at you like Zach did. It's kind of rude. Hey. Thank you for coming and uh, for spending your Thursday night with us. I know that there's a lot of things you could be doing in a city like Denver, um, but to come and make time uh, for Jesus, that's it's pretty special. And I believe that God honors moments like that. And uh, I say this every week, but I genuinely mean it. I'm well aware that there can be a lot of different views on life and maybe even views and thoughts on religion and relationships with God and who is God and can we know him and what do we have to do like I understand and the first thing I want to say is thank you for stepping into a situation that might be slightly uncomfortable I don't know if it's your first time in church ever if it's your first time in a long time but I just want to say thank you for for having the bravery and the courage to step into an environment like we don't take it lightly, and we actually genuinely pray that people like you who maybe haven't been to church in a while would come and, and not subscribe to Red Rocks, not subscribe to Young Adults, not join our club or join our ministry, but genuinely, honestly encounter God, have a relationship with Jesus. Because I believe that more than anything, more than positive thinking, uh, more, than, more than, I don't know, like making more money, whatever, I believe there's nothing more life-changing than meeting the person who made you and designed you and loved you. And that person's name is Jesus. And so tonight our focus is going to be on Jesus. And I think it's fitting because this is going to be the final Thursday before uh, that we meet before we have Easter. Uh, we're not going to meet next week just sort of in preparation for Easter Sunday. Don't boo. We'll be back the following week. Um, but, but this whole, we've been in a series called The Makings of a Miracle, and the goal of this series was to get your mind on the miraculous, because come next Sunday, the most miraculous moment in human history occurred where God himself not only died for the sins of humanity, but was physically, literally raised again to life. Because death could not defeat him or hold him down. And this resurrection picture is actually the hope of the follower of Jesus. Because like Jesus, we too one day will rise. And it's not metaphorically or metaphysically. We're not going to be risen spirits or little floating amoeba in heaven one day. We will physically rise like Jesus physically rose. Because the promise of God is that death no longer conquers us or reigns over us, but those who put their faith in Jesus will enter into eternal life. And so we've talked about what makes a miracle, leading up to the greatest miracle of all time. What makes a miracle? We talked about week one, how every miracle needs radical opposition. And then last week we talked about how every single miracle you read in the Bible not only has a moment of faith, but also a moment of courage. And tonight we're going to kind of finish up our, our making of a miracle series with what I believe is one of the hardest, but one of the most important elements of any miracle. And I'm not going to tell you what it is until later in the message, because it's how I keep you guys reeled in. You know what I mean? Let's pray, let's pray and I'll shut up and we'll then dive in. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, we love you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and to be in your presence. We don't take it lightly. You're holy. And sometimes just being in your presence makes us painfully aware of how broken we are. But what I love so much about you, Jesus, is you invite our brokenness into your holy presence with the promise of restoring us and making us not just the best version of ourself, but making us into image bearers of you. And so tonight, God, I pray that 
more than anything I could say, more than anything we could sing, that we would encounter you and encounter your presence and forever be changed. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for rising from the dead. Thank you for offering us that same opportunity so that we don't have to fear death, but that we can look forward to an eternity with you. It's in your name we pray, and everybody said amen and amen. I know you guys have heard me talk about this a couple times, but I'm a dad. And being a dad, you kind of like look at life differently. And I've noticed that I've been having some like really weird, just, I don't know, kind of like meta thoughts about things. Like not metaverse thoughts, but just, you know, kind of like really weird existential big picture thoughts. And recently, I don't know why, I've been thinking about this idea, not just idea, this reality of self-autonomy, right? This this idea that every single one of us in this room are these autonomous human beings with literally the ability to act and do and behave and think however we want to. And and autonomy, human autonomy, self-autonomy, I believe, honestly, is one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given us. I believe that part of being an image bearer, part of being made in the image of God is having the ability to act and think and behave and make decisions that actually make an impact and actually make a difference in this world. I I personally don't subscribe to the idea that every single thing that happens in this life is predetermined. I honestly believe that God made us to be like him and to co-rule this earth with him under his authority and to bring heaven to earth. And in doing so, we as humans have the ability to make decisions that actually have an impact, that actually have repercussions in this world. I believe that one of the greatest gifts God has ever given us and one of the ways we are most like God and most like Jesus is that we have the ability to be autonomous human beings. I also think autonomy can be one of the greatest curses in the world. Literally, you don't have to open the Bible too far to see that our desire for complete autonomy really crashed things pretty quickly, right? Like God created this world and he called everything good and he created like the ocean and the moon and the animals and the sun and the stars and he said, all of this is good. The way I've set things in motion is good. The way that I've created this earth and humanity to operate is good. And very quickly we see through the story of Adam and Eve that we have such a desire for autonomy and actually it's one of the biggest temptations the enemy sets forth in our life is for us to seize the ability to do do what we want, how we want to do it, and redefine what God has called good and true. Autonomy is a really interesting subject that I've just sort of been thinking about lately, but it's funny for me to watch somebody sort of start to grow and understand and grapple with and and, and realize their autonomy as a human being. I have a two-year-old daughter whose name is Ezra. We're going to put a photo of her up there. That's Ezra. Uh, at Starbucks eating a cake pop. Um, cake pop is her love language. Um, but Ezra is a, is a two-year-old, and she is truly starting to sort of realize her autonomy. She's two going on 20. Um, she, has, she genuinely has an opinion about absolutely everything. If you want to know about something, just ask her, and she will tell you. And obviously, she's two. She doesn't know what she's talking about, but she will make something up and try to convince you about it. She is, she is a very like a passionate and very brave and courageous and just beautiful little girl. But she's, she's currently at this point in her life where she is exploring the boundaries of her ability to define her life the way that she wants, right? She's two, terrible two. She's not terrible, but she does know how to push our buttons sometimes, right? And so, and so she's like figuring out like the boundaries of, of what she is allowed to do. And as her parents, Aaron and I, as, as hopefully decent parents, our job is to try to form and to mold this little two-year-old into being not just a good person, but to be a, a woman who is brave and courageous and loves Jesus and follows Jesus and knows her worth and her value. Now, as most people in this room would hopefully assume that when you're younger, it's not a bad idea to learn from older and wiser people who have been around the block a few times and maybe know how life works a little bit better than you. 
And because we are her parents and because we have her best interest in mind and know in situations what she should do, even if she doesn't do it yet, even though she's exploring her, her autonomy, we have a responsibility to have her listen to us and, and learn to obey us. Now, it is easy for her to obey a command from us when she realizes that she comes out ahead in the situation, right? And I promise you, she's smart enough to know when she comes out ahead and when she doesn't come out ahead, right? Like it's easy for her to obey when she can clearly see why we're asking her to do something or if she realizes, hey, I come out ahead on this, right? Like, hey, Ezra, if you eat your vegetables, we'll give you a popsicle after dinner. Done. I feel like I'm coming out ahead. I'm going to eat my vegetables, all right? Hey, Ezra, don't touch the stove. It's going to burn you and it's going to hurt your hand. Okay, that makes sense. I can see why my parents don't want me to touch the stove. Therefore, I will listen and I will not touch the stove, right? Hey, Ezra, it's cold outside. We need you to put your jacket on. Listen, my daughter is a Viking. She will go outside in a blizzard and negative two degree weather and literally be out there for like 10 hours. You have to like drag her back inside. She's half Mexican, but like pale bl blonde hair, blue eyes, I don't know how it works, and loves the cold weather. She's a little Nordic Mexican, if that, like, if that, if that's a thing, <laughs> like, it's easy for her to obey when she understands why or when she clearly comes out ahead, but when she doesn't clearly come out ahead, when she feels like mom and dad are trying to set her up or set her back, or when she doesn't fully quite understand why we are asking her to do something, it is hard. There is tension. There is struggle. There are blood-curdling screams from a two-year-old at the top of her lungs. Ezra, it's time to brush our teeth. Why? Because you don't want to get a cavity. What's a cavity? Be quiet and brush your teeth because I said so. You know what I mean? Ezra, it's time to brush your hair. You got yogurt and tangles in your hair. No, I don't want to brush my hair. Why would I brush my hair? Because you can't go to bed tangled. Like, you got to, like, let us brush your hair. No. Ah! You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's time to go to bed. Why? I'm not tired. You will be tired. It's easy for her to obey when she clearly understands the why or when she feels like she's coming out ahead in life. It's a little more difficult for her to obey when she doesn't understand or when it's hard or when there's tension. And watching my daughter and thinking about autonomy, it kind of made me think like, how often do I view obedience from God like my two-year-old views obedience from me, right? How often do I read the Bible and see God telling me to obey something and I kind of analyze it like, hmm. Am I going to come out ahead on this or uh, is this going to cost me something, right? Like how often do I pray or approach God and, and ask him for things? And I'm like, God, what do I get out of this? Like why would I listen to you? Why would I obey you? This, this seems kind of difficult. This seems kind of hard. I, I can't clearly see the reason why you're asking me to live this way. I can't clearly see the reason why you're asking me to give up this relationship or give up this way of life or whatever. Like I can't clearly see why. So God, why would I? I do it why would I trust you I think I'm just going to kind of push back and 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 push against and sort of do life my own way right it's hard to be obedient when we can't see why we're being asked to do something or when it feels like obedience is going to cost us something it's easy to obey when it feels like obedience is going to push us ahead but if it's going to cost me something it's hard but I feel like, and I genuinely believe, that so often miracles are birthed in the tension of when obedience is demanding some of the highest costs from us. Miracles are birthed in the tension of when obedience demands the highest level of trust in God from us. 
There's a story in Daniel chapter 3 that we're going to read here in a minute, but I kind of want to set it up for us. Daniel chapter 3, the people of Israel have finally been conquered by their enemies. The past couple stories we've read, they've been um, fighting against enemies and they've been faithful to God and God has come through, but they were in such a state of rebellion that God finally allowed them to be conquered by their enemies and they were conquered by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians were an empire of empires. Like, they did not mess around. We're talking generational empires. And Babylon always sort of represents, like, the darkest evils within humanity. Like, even in Genesis chapter 10, in Genesis chapter 11, Babylon is a city that just sort of represents the fullest extent of rebellion and humans sort of seizing autonomy for themselves. And so God's people are brought into a situation, brought into a city that just sort of represents that all the wrong, disobedient, distrust in God, like within humanity. But Babylon is an empire. They weren't stupid. They didn't just go through and like mow down everybody. They actually would, would separate people and they would ingrain them in their culture and ingrain them in their language. And they actually would find and recruit some of the smartest and brightest and most intelligent people in Israel and, and bring them on to be part of their leadership and be part of their councils for their king. And so they identified these four outstanding Israelites to, to sort of bring on and indoctrinate. Their names were Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. If you've been, uh, in, you know, grew up in, in a Sunday school or watched Veggie Tales, this, uh, this story might be a little familiar. The giant chocolate bunny, Easter time, right? Anybody? That just came to me in the green room like five minutes ago, I promise. It did. It did. <laughs> But, but they identify these brilliant Jews, these brilliant Israelites, and they're like, we're going to take these people and we're going to actually train them in our ways and we're going to give them new names and we're going to teach them our language and then we're going to make them counselors for our king. And they were, so, they were so good. God had so much favor on their life that they actually became some of the evil king's highest level counselors. They could interpret his dreams when nobody else could, and they could prophesy the things that God was planning to do within their kingdom. They would take these men and recruit these men. But these, these four individuals specifically were still faithful to God. They had God's favor on their life. They followed God. They had hidden God's word in their heart so that they would not sin against them. They knew God's word. They knew what God commanded. And even in the middle of some of the harsh, harshest oppression and even in the middle of them being colonized and, and trying to just adapt to a culture that wasn't their own, they put their faith and their trust in God because they knew God's word and they knew who God was. That's a sermon for a different day. Day. We're going to jump into God's word in the summer. But, so something, something happens here. Uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who they're sort of counseling, he is a firecracker. The dude gets set off like super quick and he seems very impulsive. And he has these moments where he's like kind of okay and then these moments where he goes really dark and he has this idea and he's like, hey, I'm going to build a giant idol statue of gold, 90 feet tall, 90 feet wide. I'm going to build it and everybody in my kingdom is going to have to bow to this thing, right? And so he, being one of the most powerful men in the world, gets all the gold, builds this giant statue, and he's like, hey, every single person in my kingdom, when the trumpet sounds, and there's like 40 different instruments they list off, we'll kind of graze over them here in a minute. Um, he's like, anytime the music is played, everybody needs to bow. Everybody needs to worship, right? But these Israelites, these four men, these three men specifically, knew God, had, the, had his word hidden in their heart, and so they refused to bow. Now, as it would happen, some snitches showed up on the scene. <laughs> and it said some haters came, and they were like, hey, king, guess what? There's three guys, and they won't bow. And this is kind of where we pick up our story. The snitches have done their thing, and, and we got Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the presence of the king. And it says, and this is the snitches talking. It's Daniel 3. It says, your majesty. Why do I just, I picture like, little, like a little Weasley, like Disney figure. You know what I mean? They always got like the wiry, like wiry beards and mustaches and stuff. 
Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, all kinds of music, fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship it will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Important side note. Whoever didn't listen to King Nebuchadnezzar was tossed into a giant fire. So ton of motivation to follow through on what this guy was asking for. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? you three guys, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up. Now, when you hear the sound of all the instruments and all the kind of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie them up and throw them into the blazing furnace. So let's, let's summarize here real quick. Evil king creates a giant idol, which why would you worship something that you literally made with your own hands that you know has no power because you just made it like a couple of days ago, right? But whatever, besides the point. Evil king creates giant idol that everybody is supposed to bow down and worship. Now, these three men knew God's word, and they knew that the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments were, you will have no other God beside me, and you will not make any idols to worship, and you will not bow down any carved images or any idols. So these guys, knowing God's word, were like, giant idol, uh, per pretend God, we know what to do here. Ignore it. It's not real. It doesn't matter. However, there's a blazing giant furnace for anybody that doesn't listen to the king, and so these men are captured and they confront the king basically saying, I don't care what you have made. We are not going to bow down and worship this thing. Can I have a moment of honesty with you? If it was Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Connor, <laughs> this is where Connor starts to slide into the background a little bit in front of the king, right? Like, you know, like they're like confronting the king, like we'll never bow. And I'm like, they might not, but I'm considering it, honestly. Like, <laughs> right? Like, this is the moment, if I'm being totally honest, where I'm kind of like, hey, God, wouldn't that be a little more useful for you and your purpose and your kingdom, I don't know, like alive rather than like dead, right? Like, am I a little more valuable walking this earth than being chucked into a fire, right? Like, God, what if I like pretend to kneel, but my knee doesn't technically touch the ground? There's like some clearance, you know what I mean? Like, does that, does that count as a bow or is that like a, a trick? Like, gotcha, Neb, you know what I mean? Like, I'll be exploring my options here, right? It's easy to obey when we know the outcome or we can see how we come out ahead, right? It's easy to obey God's word when we can clearly see the benefit that's going to come from it. But what do we do when obedience might cost us something? When we're the only one unwilling at our school or unwilling at our work to gossip or talk bad about our boss, even though they can be a jerk sometimes, right? And the employees think that you're just a suck-up, just a goody-goody looking for a promotion, right? It's easy to obey God when you can see the benefit, but what if you're the only one standing there willing to, to obey, right? It's hard to obey when it feels like it's going to cost you something, right? Right? like when you love him, like you really genuinely love him. 
but you want to honor God with your body and your sexuality, and he's pressuring you to take things a little further physically, and you know that if you say no, it could maybe end things or cause some tension, right? It's hard to obey God when there's something on the line, when it feels like it's going to cost you something. How do you respond when obedience is demanding not just a cost, but the highest cost from you? How do you respond? Because there's two things I can promise you that will always come up when it comes to radical obedience, when believing God for a miracle, or just radical obedience when following Jesus wholeheartedly with your entire life. Two things that I promise you will always encounter when you are trying to be obedient to God. Number one, it is going to be uncomfortable. You will always find situations where you are uncomfortable. And number two, there will always be an opportunity to compromise. Two things I promise you, will always be present when you are trying to be obedient to God with your life. You will always, always, always find yourself in situations that are uncomfortable, and you will always be in moments and presented with opportunities to compromise what you believe. It's going to be uncomfortable. But when did we buy into this idea that following Jesus was going to be easy anyway? Right? I want to encourage somebody in this room tonight that if you are going to do anything of importance and significance with your life, or if you are truly and genuinely not going to sit on the sidelines of Christianity, but you're going to go all in, if Jesus has truly met you and changed you and radically shaped your life, and you want to do something radical and significant and amazing for God's kingdom, I promise you, you have to, to get comfortable being uncomfortable. No great person has done any great work being comfortable. It has always pushed them to limits they did not know they had. It has always pushed them into levels of faithfulness and trust and obedience where they couldn't see the end, but they were just clinging on and believing that if God said it was right and God said it was good and God said it was true, I will follow it and I know it will lead me somewhere good. If you want to do anything of significance with your life, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Just practically for a minute, think of how uncomfortable it would have been for these three guys to be the only one in a kingdom of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people standing while everybody else around them is bowing and they know the consequence is literally death, immediate death. How uncomfortable would that be, right? How uncomfortable would it be to be found out, to be snitched on, right? Like, I literally, if I get out of this situation, I'm coming and finding where you live. Like, (laughs) how uncomfortable would it be to be bound up and presented in front of an angry king who is threatening you and saying, hey, I will give you one more chance to bow. But if you don't, I'm stoking this thing even hotter. How uncomfortable would it be to watch his little minions be chucking wood in this furnace knowing that that wood has your name on it for not listening? Wouldn't be fun, right? Wouldn't be comfortable. But if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Listen, this is not a a fiery furnace, but I remember one of the first times God ever asked me to be uncomfortable in my faith. I was a Christian. I was maybe a three-week-old Christian, baby, baby, baby Christian. And, and I remember I was just on fire. I was telling everybody in my college about Jesus. I was kind of like the weird kid that, like, just any way that I could bring up, like, you know, like Jesus, like you like pizza, pepperoni kind of reminds me of an opportunity for you to come to church because, I, like, you know what I mean? You're just, like, making crap up, and you walk away, and you're like, I killed that. And somebody's like, somebody's like I'm not eating pizza for a week. That guy freaked me out, you know? I was just like on fire, right? But I remember the first time God called me to do something that I felt in the moment was radical obedience was God asked me to call every ex-girlfriend that I had and apologize to them. Because before I was a Christian, I I have a very spotted and, and, and honestly like gross past when it comes to my relationships. And everything was cool, and me and God were vibing, right? And I was like, this is awesome, Jesus, I love you. Like, and he's like, hey, I want you to call all the girls that you had ugly, messy, gross breakups with, and I need you to call them 
and apologize. It's great. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what? Can I tell you how uncomfortable I was? Listen, it's not getting thrown into a fiery furnace. But it was wildly, wildly uncomfortable for me. I remember calling girls that I wronged, like I, I was the bad person in the breakup, and being like, hey, um, listen, I'm a Christian now, and I treated you in a way that a Christian should never treat another person, and so I just wanted to call you and apologize. And I had a couple girls be like, wow, that's so kind. Like, thank you. I can't believe you genuinely seem changed. I called a couple girls and was like, hey, I'm a Christian now. Click. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Okay, I tried, you know, <laughs> like, but I did it, and I felt like God was just like, hey, thank you for being willing to be uncomfortable. Thank you for following me and obeying me and doing whatever you could in your power to maybe mend some of the hurt and those breakups and those relationships. Thank you for following me into an area that is uncomfortable. And can I tell you, I wish that being a Christian just meant it got easier and easier and easier and easier. But it feels like God, when he knows that he can trust you to do something uncomfortable, will give you more and more and more opportunities to continue to be uncomfortable. Because most of the time, our greatest areas of discomfort are where the greatest and most powerful miracles live, right? I believe that there are some of you in this room right now, God is going to call you to an uncomfortable situation. God is going to call you to fight for sexual purity in a relationship, even though it might mean that they might leave you. Even if you've been sleeping together for weeks, months, years now, I believe that God's calling you out of that situation. And I believe that God's going to instill value in you that you don't need the affirmation of sex from another person to, to make you feel lovable and cherishable and worthy enough because in Jesus, you have all that already and you are worth waiting for and you are worth being respected. And listen, I'm not even saying that if you're sleeping around, it automatically means somebody's disrespecting you. Maybe you have an amazing relationship and maybe if you stop sleeping together, they wouldn't leave. But maybe God's just going to call you to get a little uncomfortable and step into obedience and steward and honor God with your sexuality. There are some of you in this room tonight that I believe God is going to call you into a really uncomfortable situation of calling a friend, of calling a coworker, of calling somebody that you trust and confessing a sin that you're struggling with. See, so often we like to try to handle things alone. Man, but miracles happen in community and miracles happen when we're uncomfortable, right? I believe that there's going to be some of you that God is going to challenge. You've been going to work and you've been going to school and you've just kind of been laying low as a Christian. You've been kind of playing it off like you don't really have a strong faith. God is going to call you to be uncomfortable and stand firm in your faith and take a stand for what you believe and be open and be honest about what Jesus has done in your life. I believe that God is going to call some people in this room to start getting a little uncomfortable because obedience to Jesus will lead you into some of the most uncomfortable situations in the world. But I honestly believe the greatest faith and the greatest miracles are forged in the most uncomfortable situations. God's gonna call some people to get uncomfortable tonight. But I wanna encourage you, just because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean you need to give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. Second, there will always be an opportunity to compromise. I believe deep in my heart that there are some people in this room right now that you are sitting on the verge of compromise. You've got a relationship where there's so much ability to compromise. You've got a party. You've got something in your life where compromise is right around the corner. Can I please encourage you? Don't give in. Don't compromise. Listen, so often we think that obedience is the key to unlocking our miracle. If I just obey, God will reward. If I just obey, God will reward. Sometimes maybe. But sometimes God asks for our obedience just because he wants to know if he can trust us. And sometimes, and can I say oftentimes, if you read scripture and you read throughout the Bible, you will see that so often there might be somebody waiting in the corner of your peripheral that is looking to see if you will be faithful and you will obey and you won't compromise and they receive a miracle by you being obedient. 
check this out. I know, I know we're closing up. I know the band's playing behind me. One more big chunk of scripture, promise, and we're going to fly through this. Daniel 3, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames and the fire actually killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men? that we tied up and threw into the fire. Come on, certainly your majesty, he said, but look, I see a fourth walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High, the man who just created a fake god to worship, sees the obedience of other men and says, hold up, something is happening. These men were thinking, hey, a miracle would be me not being tossed in the fire. But a miracle of their obedience is actually a wicked and evil king being exposed to the reality of the goodness and the faithfulness of a God that would not leave them or forsake them and would actually stand with them in their most uncomfortable and trying situation. God did not just leave them alone when they were uncomfortable. Man, somebody needs to get a hold of this. The situation that God is calling you into, He's not calling you there to test you. He is standing there with you in the middle of it. You might feel like you're going in alone, but your friends, your enemies, whatever will say, it felt like there was two of you in this situation, right? Like it felt like something was empowering you, like you were standing firm, like you had somebody at your back. There will be somebody standing in the fire with you. He says, servants of the Most High, come out. So they came out of the fire and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. And Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied my command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any God except their own. For no other God can save this way. Listen, there are people in your peripheral who will only receive a miracle based out of your obedience, right? See, we read that story and we're like, what a miracle, they didn't die. But I read that story and I say, what a miracle. The most powerful, wicked leader in the world confessed that there is a God and that he saves his people and that he honors obedience. Your obedience could be the thing that unlocks somebody meeting Jesus. Will you stand to your feet? But can I tell you, here's something that I love so much about our God. Here's something that I love so much about Jesus. Listen, he is so good. Man, Jesus is so good that he will never call you to a level of obedience that he doesn't even understand. I think so often we feel like when God calls us to obey, he's kind of like, impress me, prove to me your faith, show me, show me how much you believe, show me how much you care. But man, just thinking about Easter, thinking about the greatest gift ever given to humanity, Jesus never calls us to something he wasn't first willing to walk through. And Philippians 2 says this, it says, this is about Jesus being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. Jesus as a man humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death on a cross. Therefore, because he was obedient, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at that name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus was obedient to the point of death. And listen, can I tell you the greatest recipient of the miracle of Jesus' obedience wasn't Jesus. It was me. The greatest recipient of the miracle of the obedience of Jesus was me. A broken, hurt, messed up, confused, lost soul being invited home, being welcomed into the whosoever believes can be changed. Listen, there are some of you in this room, God is calling you into an uncomfortable situation. 
There are some of you in this room that, that you, you are trying to be obedient. And man, you just have every opportunity in the world to fall into compromise. Can I encourage you? Stay strong in the faith. Look to the cross. Look to the forerunner of our faith, the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ, who he himself humbled himself and was obedient to the point of death so that we in this room could find life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I wanna ask two questions. Number one, I believe that there's somebody in this room tonight that God is calling you to take a step of radical obedience and you're afraid because it feels uncomfortable. It feels isolating. It feels like your friends won't understand, your family won't understand, your boyfriend or girlfriend won't understand, but God is calling you into some level of a radical obedience. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I wanna pray for you. You're like, man, I don't know, just something about tonight just made me feel like God is saying, hey, I've got something more for you, but you need, to, you need to trust me. You need to follow me. And it might look like I've abandoned you. It might look like you're the only one kind of walk in this direction, but I'm here with you. I want to pray for you. And number two, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, I just want to offer a simple invitation to meet him. That God was so loving and so humble that he would make a way to rewrite your past and erase your history and write for you a good and beautiful and courageous future full of love and full of grace, full of forgiveness and full of acceptance. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus and you would like to meet him, would you just slip up your hand? Listen, there's no magic prayer. There's no magic action you can take. It's just a simple acknowledgement of Jesus. I don't know you, but I want to. I believe that just opening your heart up to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want to meet you. Will you forgive me of my sin? Will you be my Lord? And God will shoot into your heart so fast you won't even imagine. You will feel like, like you're almost floating. I, I honestly believe that. I remember when I first accepted Jesus, I literally just felt like, a, like I bowed my head as one person and I opened my eyes as a completely different person. If that's you, lift up your hands. I want to pray, Jesus, for every single person in this room with their hand raised that they want to meet you. God, I pray that they would just open up their heart to you. If that's you, would you just say, Jesus, will you meet with me? Will you forgive me? Can I know you? And if you're in this room and maybe you lifted your hand because you feel like God's calling you to some level of obedience, God, I pray right now that you would remind their soul there's no opposition too great that you cannot handle. God, that you are calling them to faith and to courage. And God, I pray right now that even though it might be hard, even though it might be tough, even though it might be uncomfortable, even though it might feel isolating, even though there might be opportunity after opportunity to compromise, would you give them the faith and the courage to listen and obey and trust you? And not only for themselves, but for the people whose stories you are gonna write in the wake of their obedience. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. And everybody here, young adults said, amen. And amen, young adults, let's worship.